it's very hard to explain to people the meaning of freedom if they never lost freedom. This evening I will be talking to Mohamedou Old Sly, artist in resident uh, here at the Bali, we're very proud of that, who spent 14 years in Guantanamo Bay, 15 years in prison, uh, and with Larry Seams, who edited Mohamedou's book while he was in prison, Guantanamo Diary. We've been looking at a very short collection of pictures from New York in 9-11. You're a New Yorker. How do you look upon those images? It's so important for people to understand what the experience was to be there. You know, it's horrifically traumatic to, to look at those images. But the reaction to that is not, um, is not in, in line with what the United States did. America had a choice at that moment. They could have um, treated this as a criminal matter. Oh, thank you. As a criminal matter and, and you know, gone through Interpol and brought people to justice <coughs> trial in New York. Everybody in New York would have welcomed that, you know. Um, or we could have done this military response, and that was just a truly fatal mistake. Nobody in New York would have asked for that. Um, and so I think it's really important um, to say this because I don't think it gets talked about enough, was the difference in reaction from people who lived in New York and people who lived outside of New York. Um, there was never a moment in New York where um, we wanted to go to war. That was not the response of New Yorkers. The response of New Yorkers, this is actually well documented, was to go to the library and check out books about Islam to try to figure out what culturally had gone wrong um, that led to this moment. That was a very typical New York reaction to what happened in response. One of the things which went wrong was that um, people were arrested who uh, had no uh, guilt at all, and um, one of them was Muhammad Ould Sly. One of the b biggest casualties of 9-11 is democracy and the rule of law. They, were, they took a very big hit. And I'm from a region where people still are trying to enjoy the same kind of freedom that you enjoy here, you take for granted. And after 9-11, this was like out of the window because they say, if the United States of America can do all of this, we don't need to uh, respect the rule of law. It was like a god sent to the dictatorial regime. Now let's listen for a moment to the book. A person was undoing the chains on my wrists. He undid the first hand and another guy grabbed that hand and bent it while a third person was putting on the new, firmer and heavier shackles. Now my hands were shackled in front of me. Somebody started to rip my clothes with something like a scissors and I was like, what the heck is going on? I started to worry about the trip I neither wanted nor initiated. Somebody else was deciding everything for me. I had all the worries in the world but making a decision. And many thoughts went quickly through my head. The optimistic thoughts suggested, maybe, maybe you're in the hands of Americans, but don't worry, they just want to take you home and make sure that everything goes in secrecy. The pessimistic ones went, you screwed up. The Americans managed to pin some shit on you and they're taking you to US prisons for the rest of your life. I was stripped naked. It was humiliating. But the blindfold helped me miss the nasty look of my naked body. During the whole procedure, the only prayer I could remember was the crisis prayer. Ya hayu, ya kayum and I was mumbling it all the time. Whenever I came to be in a similar situation, I would forget all my prayers except a crisis prayer, which I learned from the life of our prophet, peace be upon him. Then one of the team wrapped a diaper around my private parts. And only then was I dead sure that the plane was heading to the United States. Now I start to convince myself that everything is going to be all right. My only worry was about my family seeing me on TV in such a degrading situation. I was so skinny. I've always been, but never that skinny. My street clothes had become so loose that I looked like a small cat in a big bag. 
When the US team finished putting me in clothes they tailored for me, a guy removed my blindfold for just a moment. I couldn't see much because he directed the flashlight right into my eyes. He was wrapped from hair to toe in a black uniform. He opened his mouth and stuck out his tongue, gesturing for me to do the same, a kind of AHH test, which I took without resistance. I saw part of his very pale, blonde-haired arm, which cemented my theory of being in Uncle Sam's hands. So when they stripped me naked, I knew that I would, would never go back. And this was like a revelation to me. And then when I start to regret all the things, the bad things I did in my life. And I will tell you what I didn't regret, for instance. I did not regret not having money. I did not regret, you know, not having like uh, an apartment in Saint Kim around this small party. I did not regret so many beautiful women that they never wanted me. <laughs> and I was so frustrated. I did not, they did not mean anything to me at that. But one thing meant everything to me. Every time I made bad comment to anyone I love, anyone like my mother, my sisters, my partner, my brothers, my friends, and I vowed from that moment a vow of kindness that I will always be kind, no matter what, every day. And, uh, and it's just like, you know, it's just like I was given another life. Did you know, Larry, that um, America was locking up people without trial? The story around Mohamedou is essentially wrapped up with secrecy and censorship. So, you know, these secret prisons were, were being opened and they were being opened specifically to torture people because you can't torture people in public because it's an international human rights crime that's, uh, you know, codified in international law. It's codified in U.S. law. If somebody tortures, they must be brought to justice. If somebody is tortured, they must be, there must be reparations. They must be made whole. This is the Convention Against Torture. It's U.S. law. So it, could not, it cannot happen. It's very important that you pointed out that the reason for the secrecy is the fact that they wanted to torture people. Absolutely. It was, and it's absolutely, yeah. it, it, it's, yeah. um, what do they because call it in law? So, mens mens rea, so, right? It's not so obvious to... to yeah. Yeah. No. But, but, but it is. It's criminal intent. It's criminal it's, intent. Yeah, it's criminal, it's that's criminal right. intent. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that was, that was the reason for the secrecy to begin with. But the more horrifying part of the censorship story is that by 2004 mm. or 2005, when Mohamedou wrote this remarkable manuscript in Guantanamo, the United States knew perfectly well that any of its suspicions were unfounded. You know? But Mohamedou was held for another 10 years in Guantanamo. Mohamedou was one of the most tortured people in Guantanamo for some really weird reason. Throughout history, torturers have kept fanatically uh, meticulous records of torture. Every time a torturing regime falls, you'll find they find an archive. You know, you, th you think of the Stasi, you think of the, the government of Argentina, the government of Brazil. You know, why do they do it? I think they do it because if you're torturing and you keep a record, it's a way of showing that you're in a chain of command, right? You're doing, you're just following orders. So Mohamedou's case was, was well documented. His manuscript was kept classified and locked up in a warehouse in a secret facility outside of Washington, D.C. for seven more years. Why? Simply to suppress the story. Guantanamo is open today for no, no national security purpose whatsoever. The 39 men who are there now, you know, some of them could have been tried, should have been tried in criminal courts in the United States um, for actual involvement with the 9-11. They'll probably, they may never be tried um, because they'll be so tainted their, their cases by torturing them uh, so badly. Um, but the secrecy, Guantanamo remains open today for one reason. It's just like a file cabinet for secrets, you know. Um, they finally had to let Mohammed go because the book was out. So I wanted to tell my family, I didn't do any of this. I want to tell the world. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't allowed to have a pen or paper because I was considered a bad person. So, and, but they would give other detainees like, papers and pens, because allowing them to write letters to their family. Mm -hmm. We also have thou shall not steal. 
but nothing says shall not borrow. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I figured <laughs> I figured I could borrow it. Yeah. For so, good purpose. Yeah. Yeah. And then so and then I would take and they would the tennis would pass me through the end. You know, it's like very small, like this cell. Very small. Yeah. If you look at the, the the movie The Mauritanian we talked that last year, you see the full, very small. Very small. So, yeah. They would pass me and then I would write, 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 write very quickly, write, write, and then give it back. And then I hide it. Could you hide it in the small cell? Yes, you put it like, next time you go to prison, come to me. Ah, <laughs> I teach you everything. <laughs> Seriously, I know all the tricks. <laughs> the first thing any writer does when they go to jail is write a memoir and then when they're in prison. So, you know, they're, they're a dime a dozen, I, I promise you, you mm -hmm. know. I'd seen many of them. And so when I got Mohammadi's manuscript, I, I, you know, I knew that this was important because I knew, like I said, I knew the story of what happened to him, you know. But I, 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 I got it on a CD-ROM and I took it home and I put it in my computer and I printed out the 466 pages. And I sat down on my couch with this sense of dread, you know, just like, this is going to be hard. It's going to be, you know, painful. Um, it's going to be often unreadable, you know, and I'm going to have to decide what to do with this. And I sat down and I read it from beginning to end without getting up, and I laughed out loud um, sometimes. Um, I, I, I was amazed by Muhammadu's insistence that he would not um, depersonalize uh, and anonymize and erase the identities of the Americans who were he was in contact, but he would treat them with the, uh, the respect that they were individual people with individual motivations, every single one of them. Um, that, you know, that's why Mohammedu was, was that, that's why the book was suppressed and that's why Mohammedu was suppressed because it is a, uh, a, a, a living uh, negation of the, the, the attempt to extinguish humanity um, Mohammedu's humanity, and he answered that with this incredibly humane um, and 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 deeply literary uh, composition. So, you know, it was it, for me. I was given this opportunity of a lifetime to you know deal with the human rights questions that I dealt with, with the censorship questions that I dealt with, with the literary, um, you know, with the uh, just love of literature. You know, just that the, what literature does that nothing else can do. Um, and so, you know, that, I, I, it was an entirely different experience when it, that I expect that I expected, and, and um, uh, I, I, yeah, it was remarkable. You know, we are a story. We are a story. We ourselves, as human people, beings, as human beings, yes, as human beings. Yeah. When we go into a social setting, mm -hmm. everybody wants to tell people what they did. Yeah. So I did. So I, I bought these at, mm -hmm. because they want to be acknowledged. Yeah. And we are just a story. And if your story, if you are not allowed to tell your story, you don't exist anymore. You are not being allowed to exist. And uh, mm -hmm. you see this among all detainees. And this shocked the lawyers because my lawyers think, for instance, and it's very logical, that my first priority is to go home. That's not my first priority. My first priority is my story to be known. That's my first priority. So I'd been doing human rights work for 25 years at this point, you know, and, and um, I was kind of wondered about myself because I would have very difficult days, you know, but even in my most difficult days in dealing with, you know, families or people who had been to terrible things, I always had this ability to kind of go home and have a beer and watch the baseball game and go to sleep, right? And then I'd get up the next day and, you know, I was like, I could really separate these things, you know? And about four or five months into editing this manuscript, I started having really horrific nightmares. Just one night out of nowhere of intense, grotesque violence. And I was the agent of violence. I was, I was doing unspeakable things to people. And it happened one night, and I woke up, and I was uh, just freaked out. Never had I had anything like that. And then I went to sleep the next night, and I woke up in the same thing. And it went on for like three 
nights, four nights. And I was really starting to worry about myself. I just like, you know, and, and I, I said to my partner, who's a therapist and social worker, you know, I said, I'm having these unbelievable violent dreams. I don't know what's going on. And she looked at me and she's like, I, I made, my desk was in the corner of the bedroom and the manuscript was there and my notes and everything. She looked at me and she looked at the desk and she looked at me and she said, you don't know what's going on? Are you an idiot? You know, but this was like I had done, I had had encounters with stories of trauma my whole life, you know, but somehow the way Mohamedou writes this story, his strategies, which include humor, you know, which include this incredible empathy, which, you know, this incredible ability to, you know, to, to, to present these people who are doing unspeakable things as, as, as humane and interesting and human people, funny people sometimes, um, sad people other times. Somehow that broke through it for me. And I just, I, 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 felt, I felt the truth of, I felt the, the level of violence in a way that I'd never experienced with anything before. Uh, it does not bother me at all because I know in my heart I don't hate them and I don't hate anyone and I don't think that anyone with knowledge and with education would be able to hate anyone or to imprison themselves. And why it's easier for someone in my situation to forgive, I think this is like very tragic that we only know what matters when we face death. This is really, we will never know what matters to us before we face death. Like Larry would never know really what matters in his life except the moment. I faced death many times in prison, you know. So I just hope, I, I, all I'm saying is that being a bad person, being a good, forgiving person is easier than being bad. And I'm a lazy person, and I always take the, <laughs> the short, uh, the short. The short cut. Yes. The, the road is of less resistance. Yes, absolutely. That's <laughs> me. <laughs> ah, yeah. Um, I just, you, I want to say, just uh, say one thing, uh, although I, I, I'm reluctant to say anything after that, but I, I do, I, so I've thought a lot about this, you know, and had this conversation a lot with Mohamedou, um, because my first reaction was, yeah, come on, that's clever, but really, seriously, and then I, then I really deeply it's understood. true. Yeah. You never believed me. Yeah, no, I, I said, okay. <laughs> like, he did, he did an interview when he landed in Mauritania, and he said, I forgive everyone, and so when I saw him a couple weeks later, I said, Nice move. That was really smart, you know? Like, but seriously. Smart way of P doing PR. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I was like, really, <laughs> yeah. that's really good. You know, but you, you must really be angry, you know? And he's like, then, then I learned that this, the way in which forgiveness is self-liberation, right? And it, it's absolutely, I've seen it. I've seen it. I, I understand it. But I want to really make an important point here, is that his forgiveness, I'm going to say of me, you know, let's say of my country, of my you know, me representing my country, doesn't absolve me or my country of the responsibility of accounting for and correcting and apologizing for and repairing those crimes. And I think that's, you know, that's so important because Mohamedou has freed himself. We have not freed ourselves. You know, torture is something that is devastating for the person who's tortured and for the, the torturers. It um, crushes the humanity of both of them. And a lot of what's happening in the United States now, um, a, a lot of the crisis in the United States, and it is an enormous and deep crisis in the United States, um, has, has something to do with the problem of impunity and the lack of accountability and the inability to um, process and apologize for past mistakes. Um, to confront them and to make them right. Once Mohamedou's voice was out there, there was no reason to keep him in detention, so he was released within a year and a half after the book was published. I didn't know. I, I don't know what's going on because I'm in a prison. You, did, you didn't know? You didn't and know I was not good. allowed to have this book. I was not allowed to have a copy when it mm -hmm. was re uh, released. No copy. 
And then I saw on TV, I was in a Spanish lesson. <laughs> I took Spanish lesson because I wanted to fit in. <laughs> because in Guantanamo Bay. In Guantanamo Bay. And uh, my teacher was Ahmed. He's from Egypt, <laughs> teaching a Mauritanian Spanish. In, in, that in story. Cuba. In Cuba. <laughs> in Cuba. In Cuba. <laughs> that story, and he does not speak Spanish, by the way. So that story you cannot make up. <laughs> and so, and we, we sat in the class, and I was shackled to the floor, you know, just like you see in the movie. And then the TV, it was uh, RT. First, first news, me with the book. And, uh, and I felt like freedom. You know, honestly, I can tell you this much, that you can feel freedom inside a cell. And you can feel freedom, or you can feel like bondage when you are at your home. When you hate, you are in prison. When you are intolerant, you are in prison because no one will free you because you, you, your prison is you, yourself. And then when I, I, I went outside, was walking, singing, and I was in isolation, absolute isolation. I cannot see anyone. You know, but that my story was out there that people would talk about me and they know I'm innocent was really big, you know. I, I, I remember this day, Nancy Hollander and I were, you know, going to do this public event with the, with the British publisher and we did a round of press around that. And one of, the, one of the places that she insisted that we do was an interview with RT. And I had stopped... RT is Russia Today. Yeah, Russia, Russia Today. Yes. And I had stopped doing interviews with Russia today um, because... For good reasons. Yeah. For good reasons. So I said to Nancy, nope, no RT, don't do it. And she said, no, we have to do RT. That's the one we must do. And I said, why? And she said, because yeah, Mohammed... Yeah, tell him will, why. She said, tell him she why. Said, she said, Mohammed will see it. They won't let them watch Fox. They won't, but they do let them watch RT. So we went and we did this interview at yes, RT. Yes, that's why. Yeah, that's yeah, why. yeah, it was crazy. I know you wouldn't understand. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's absolutely surreal. So surreal. I, I love Mohammed. I love what you said about we are our stories. That's an incredible thing. I, and I was thinking about the, the man and the manuscript, the actual funny parallelism of those words, right? And, you know, the, the question, you know, that you were saying, uh, um, that you know his book was held, you know, but it it, it wasn't. It, it was he was held, right? Mm -hmm. And and the book was his one of his attempts to tell the story. But releasing him meant he would be able to tell the story anywhere, anytime, right? And like, I think about like, like tonight, like tonight. Yes. No. But I think about this. So let's let you know. In 2005, when Mohammedu wrote the manuscript, and the U.S. government knew not only that he shouldn't be there, but that the manuscript was a record of criminal activity, right, of a major human rights crime. But imagine if at that point the United States had said, okay, we're going to cut our losses here. We know he's, this is an innocent man. We're going to let him go. Mm -hmm. you know, I can tell you what would have happened in 2005 because at that point the United States didn't even publicly release the names. The military didn't publicly release the names of the men who were in prison in Guantanamo until 2004, and they did it because the Associated Press went to court on a Freedom of Information Act lawsuit to get those names um, released. So that's how much we were, we were you know, just, like I say, extinguishing, negating the, 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 the lives of the men who were there, right? Mm -hmm. In 2005, if Mohamedou had been released, you know Mohamedou, look at, the, you see him, he speaks English, he would have been on CNN Every time there was a Guantanamo story, there would have been somebody that they could go to. They could have called him and said, you know, what's, there's a hunger strike in Guantanamo. 2005, 2006, there were major hunger strikes. They would have called Mohamedou. Mohamedou, you know, they, he would have been on and he would have given that perspective. And suddenly, you know, the, 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 this, the, the detainees would have had a physical voice in the world. And so, you know, yes, his manuscript was locked up, but more importantly, he as the storyteller was locked up. So, you know, and, and, and even, even when they released the manuscript, you saw how censored it was, right? When I, when I was editing the manuscript, I had a lot of trouble with that, right? I thought, if I don't do my best to fill in the censorship, you know, to tell what's under those boxes, I'm failing in my role as his editor and, and as a free expression human rights advocate. 
you know, so my first job through was to try to make, I made those black boxes gray, and I would put in there, if I knew, if I knew just from reading it many times that the name that was redacted was actually the same interrogator who had appeared in chapter four, I would, I would note that, right? Or one of the weird things that they do is they, 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 they censored every single female pronoun, she and her. So, you, so that you would not know that the interrogators who were actually sexually assaulting him, taking off their tops, molesting him, that somehow they were trying to, to, to hide the fact that these were women, not men. Well, it's obvious from the context, most of the point, but one of the, why were they doing that? Well, they were hiding the fact that the US military was, was abusing its own female enlistees and officers and forcing them to sexually assault the detainees um, and they were instrumentalizing the, 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 the sex of their you know, soldiers as part of their attempts to, to torture their prisoners. So there are all these things. So I, I thought, that's a, that's a major story. That's a huge, important story. You it know? is. So, so my, you know, my job is I cannot let that go without saying she, right? I know it's a she. It's obvious. You can count the number of letters that would fit in that space. It's not a he, it's one letter more. Yeah, exactly, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And, um, you know, um, and so I, I actually brought the, my, the editor, the first time I brought this, you know, somewhat gray, the gray version of this, you know. Um, but as the more I thought about it, you know, there, there were complications to that. People could have gotten in trouble if I did that. It might have made Mohammed's situation more difficult. Yeah. You know, that was, a, that was a consideration. But one thing changed my mind about it was that there was one line in it where Mohammedu says, he said, um, I could not help breaking down in, and the word is censored. And then the next sentence is something like, I don't know what's wrong with me these days, but it's just the slightest gesture of kindness will make me cry. That's uncensored. They censored the word tears. There is no other word that could have gone in that box, right? So I was asking myself, so why? Why would you do that? Why would you, you know, it's not, there's no national security aspect to the word tears, right? And suddenly I just had this picture of a person who had a job. They gave her this person a black pen. You've met this person. You actually yes, met the I mean, person who censored your book. Um, but they had, there was a person who sat there, probably several, you know, because it came in, in, in installments, as Mohammed said, you write. 30 pages, put it in an envelope, they would send it off to the privilege facility, this guy would read it, right? You know, so they're going through and they're deciding when they're gonna release it publicly, what are gonna censor? And I, I could see this person reading that and being so, so emotionally affected by that, that their instinct was to cross it out. For some reason, that can't get out. You know, just the, that, 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 human, that human moment, you know? And the, the fact that that human moment was connected to kindness, it was a guard who, a, a Puerto Rican guard. He started talking yes. about learning Spanish. Learning Spanish was, was a useful thing because many of Mohammedu's guards were Spanish speaking because this is the United States Army, right? So, but one of, one of and he writes beautifully about the, 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 the kindness of the Puerto Rican guard unit as compared to, to other guards. But the, the, the guard reached out and just touched him on the shoulder after all this isolation and said, don't worry, man, you're gonna go home. And, he, and, and Muhammad who cried. And there was something about that scene that made this person whose job was to censor sensitive information just to go, well, can't have that in there. And then I realized, well, okay, Muhammad is still in prison. It, I can't, I can't in good, I can't, it th 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 has to be published this way because he's still being subject to this silencing and this violence. So we can't pretend that we, you know, that he's being allowed to say these things or, 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 or say these things. And in fact, when you look at it, it's like the, the censorship is the, a character in the book. It's like the United States government, you know, it has a hand in that book, just as they still had a hand in, in, in you know, Muhammadu's fate. So when Muhammadu got out, it, you know, I finally got to see him about three weeks after he was released. I got on a plane and flew to Mauritania. And the first thing he said to me is, you know, we're, we're doing an uncensored version. I leave it at that for the moment. Um, it's important, I think, to say, because we didn't really say so, that um, after 14 years, Mohamedou was sent back to Mauritania without being charged and without an apology. And I think uh, that is important to say um, after you've been tortured. 
had held uh, for 15 years. Um, we leave it at that. Thank you, Larry. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Yuri. Thank you all. Thank you, my brother. Thank you so much.